All right, testing. Derek, you got audio there on your side? Yep. Test, test, testing one, two. Can you hear me? Hello? Testing, testing. Test, test, testing one, two. Hey, I got you tracking over here. Test, test, test. Testing, testing. There we go. Derek, I got you. You got me? Yeah, I got you. I think uh, everybody else can hear us. We are on. Fantastic. Well, hey, guys, sorry about a little bit of technical challenges there. Looks like I got a bad headset. I apologize. Um, we'll go ahead without further ado and go ahead and get rolling. Uh, tonight, or I guess uh, this afternoon here, we're going to be covering the pre-fund product, the operational flow of it. Uh, what you guys can expect, what your clients can expect, uh, hopefully try to give you guys a better understanding of uh, the overall process. And, uh, you know, first off, I just want to, um, you know, basically say, hey, you know, thanks for your patience up to this point. Uh, this is a new product, program, uh, and, and really uh, process for the industry as a whole. And uh, it's new to the bank. Uh, First Money Center uh, is new to the industry doing this. And, uh, you know, there's there's been a few uh, hitches along the way, but I'm uh, certainly happy to uh, say that uh, you guys that are on the webinar here today, uh, you are here because you are approved for the product. We have uh, a number of offices that didn't meet the criteria, having some prior experience in the industry or return volume. Uh, that we could not uh, get approved for it. So um, happy to say that you guys do have that ability uh, and you uh, should have that uh, understanding simply by receiving uh, the invitation for this as well as some additional correspondence from us. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead, I'll turn it over to Derek uh, and we are going to be running through uh, everything from um, office best practices, applying for the product, uh, what your clients can expect walking out of your office and for the next 24 to 48 hours from that point on. So with that being said, uh, Derek, I will go ahead and get it back over here to you. No problem. So titled ins and outs of working with the pre-fund advance, uh, you already been looking at the uh, cover page, so we're going to go ahead and come over to here where we're really just going to run through a little summary of what we're going to cover today. First thing is what is the pre-fund product? First and foremost, it is a loan to the taxpayer. Okay, so it is a loan product that is offered to the taxpayer. It's been structured in such a way that nobody's got to worry about being qualified small lenders, etc. We're just talking about a very simple loan. All the risk and everything is handled by the first money center in this case, and the amounts that are available for people who are approved are for $400 or $750. The customers, by the way, are approved 
and declined based entirely on data inside the tax return. There's no background credit check. There's no need to submit further information. It's entirely based upon what data is sent to the IRS. They make their decision. It's an instantaneous process, and we'll cover a little bit more about that. But there's no credit check. There's no need for them to uh, you know, provide ID information or other things to the bank directly like you would if you were going into a, a regular lending type of scenario. There are no fees to the taxpayer. Uh, that's a really big one here. Uh, the fees are going to go to the ERO. We'll actually cover that towards the end of the presentation. So this isn't going to cost them anything more than they would have normally if for whatever for whatever product that they're choosing for their for the rest of the refund. And then this is probably the biggest portion of it is that all of these applicants, anybody who's applying for this product, is going to have to e-sign an application and agreements on the product website. You can only take it so far. It's up to them to carry the torch the rest of the way. So first off, what do we need to obtain this loan? The very first thing is an IRS accepted electronically filed tax return. The bank does not have any of the client information. You create the e-file, you have the application, you send it to the filing center. There is nothing that they get whatsoever until the return has been accepted. So once the return hits the IRS's servers, still nothing. When the IRS sends that acknowledgement back, that says this return has passed our muster, it is considered as accepted, that's when the bank gets the information forwarded over to them. There are certain conditions on the return that must be met, there are certain forms that are prohibited, certain forms that are required, and we'll have a little bit more on this later specifically. There are certain categories of returns that are automatically too risky in order to qualify for the product. So we'll, we'll actually go through what those forms are um, when, when, when we get to that slide. And then this one right here is a really important facet of it is that the client themselves must complete the application process within 48 hours or the ability to receive the loan expires. They complete the return and they get the opportunity to actually go e-sign it and look at the agreements and everything. 48 hours pass and they don't do it, then the opportunity is gone and, and, that's, and that's it. Joe already mentioned, am I approved for prefund products? Yes, this webinar is only for approved providers. If you, if you are here, you, you got it. You have the ability to provide this product pretty much immediately. Where does the loan end up? It's going to end up on a green dot debit card. The cards and check stock uh, should be at your office, if not already. They've been, they've been being shipped all week. Uh, prior weeks they were mailed out. Everybody's been getting them. If you don't have them, uh, feel free to get in touch with us. We can try and see where your shipment's ending up, uh, but you should have them, and it's going to go on those debit cards. What about the rest of the refund? Well, when you do this product, the rest of the refund can be pretty much placed on anything else on the, on the actual bank page. You can have it placed on a check printed in your office. You can have the remainder deposited on the same green dot card. You can have the refund direct deposited to their personal bank account, or you can have it deposited via the Walmart direct to cash option that they can go pick up at any Walmart with a service center. If you have any particular questions over the differences between those, we do have webinars covering bank products. Most of you guys are probably already familiar with how that works anyway. The rest of the refund, when they get it, is going to be reduced by the amount of the loan and the regular bank fees. There's no additional fees from the loan that are going to be taken from the client whatsoever. So whatever they were expected to get, they're going to get. And that's going to be right there on the bank page when you're applying for it. It's not going to have any extra costs tacked on to the client. So if they you know, apply for this product, they're not getting charged any more money. A couple of other final points sort of about the product itself, because uh, we're going to be uh, going through a lot of actually showing you how to do it, showing you the steps. Uh, this is an important question. What if a client's return gets rejected? Well, you will have to work to complete and send the return with fixes for the rejection if it's possible. Uh, if there is no acceptance, there is no loan. It, it's not, like I said, hitting the servers and going to the IRS and, and you know the bank gets it immediately. It's once the IRS has cleared it and it is accepted. If it's not accepted, if it's you know sitting there rejected, it's, it's not going to matter. They won't have anything until that acknowledgement of acceptance comes back. And you've got to keep in mind as well that if the fix for that reject involves adding one of the prohibited forms that we're going to talk about later, then there also will be no loan. So anybody who's coming in and the fix for a reject involves putting something on the return that's going to prevent the product, then anything that you had set up prior, it'll just 
basically go back to whatever the normal funding was going to be for that return anyway. As well, if the client is not approved, if they apply for the product, passes the muster, the return gets accepted, everything's good. If the client is not approved for the loan because the bank determines that they're too much of a risk or whatever, then the refund process will proceed as normal. There's no additional fees to anyone and there's no refund delays. The refund will just basically continue as though you'd never done the product in the first place, just like they'd walked in going to do a bank product. Going into the process, the process is actually fairly straightforward. I'm going to talk through it, and then I'm going to actually show it. And the first one, the, the most obvious step is that you have to complete the client's tax return and select the bank product option in order to load up the, the application page where you can choose these things. This will allow you to select that prefund product on the SB app page of the return. And when I was talking about those prohibited forms, there are some form restrictions that do exist with this that will automatically make you incapable of selecting the prefund. First off, anybody who's filing a form 1040 SS or PR, which if I'm not mistaken, nobody even has the ability to do those outright in the regular 1040 series anyway. Those are forms for the uh, self-employment income in the United States Oceanic Territories like Virgin Islands and then the, uh, the 1040 for Puerto Rico. So if you have any of those, can't use the product with it. The other forms, and there are four main forms that cannot be present on the return. One of them is the 4684, casualty and theft. Form 4852, which is the substitute form W-2. Form 8379 for injured spouse allocation. And then the big one and the one that will be the most common of these four is the Form 8862, which is the uh, information to allow EIC. Basically, they've gotten in trouble in the past with claiming EIC when they shouldn't have, either claiming kids that weren't theirs or income or expenses that shouldn't have been on there, and the IRS has flagged their return. Any one of those four forms, and that one in particular, tells the bank that there is too much risk associated with it to provide the product, and it doesn't even give you the option to file with a prefund. And lastly, extension payments on the return. If you file an extension payments on the return, it's going to not let you do it either because obviously an extension means you need time to work on it. There is no completed return. Bank can't properly assign risk or provide a product uh, when, when you're dealing with that. And the last restriction, and this one is probably going to affect most of the offices in there that are willing to offer these products to their clients, is that the return must have at least one Form W-2 or Form 1099-R. You need to have a legitimate wage and income statement or a legitimate uh, pension and annuity statement, something that is reported to the IRS and serves as the basis for income on the return, probably with withholding on it. Their own internal systems will calculate whether or not a person's approved pretty much instantaneously, and we obviously don't have the actual formulas and the actuarial calculations that they use. But in order to do it, you can't have just uh, interest income or just Schedule C income. It needs to have at least a W-2 or a 1099-R. If you don't have either of those two forms present on the return, then the return uh, will not have the option to have the prefund product selected. Step two is once the return is complete, you go to the bank page and you select the prefund option, uh, the box near the top of the application. I'll actually show you guys if you haven't already seen it yourself, but it's right above where you select what type of product they want. Uh, you, you go to the bank page and you complete that option. And then the remainder step for three is to just complete the rest of the bank application and have them sign any of the paperwork like normal, just basically finish the return using, a, using the bank product pages like you would normally. You go through the rest of it, select what type of refund dispersal they want, put their ID information, have them sign the signature pages, etc. cetera. Um, the bank application as well will also have an option for your client to receive text notifications for the client. Um, so if you do have somebody who maybe wants to use an email, uh, sorry, email, a text notification to be told about the ability to go apply for the loan, then you can make sure that you can select that option and you'll want to have a cell phone number on the main info page and I'll, I'll show you guys that when we're in there. And then step four is to send the return. Anybody whose submission of their returns is reliant on providing us documentation uh, to, to the internal system that we have. Uh, for anybody that needs to send documents to us, upload it as soon as possible, otherwise the return sits there until we have everything we need to send it. 
from this point on, the process, the rest of it is essentially completely dependent upon the taxpayer, and that's assuming that the uh, return is accepted by the IRS. So when the return is accepted, and this is the this is the thing that uh, is really important here. Once it's accepted, the bank pretty much immediately sends an email or text notification to the client and says, "Hey." Your loan is basically ready. Go to myprefund.com. And when they get the option to go to myprefund.com, that's where they're going to uh, provide their uh, identity by verifying their name, date of birth, and social security number. And that's where they're going to be able to create their account so they can actually go through and e-sign uh, e the application. So that is definitely, uh, definitely something that we want going on here. Uh, now, while I'm going to take a second from this uh, presentation, and what we're going to do is I'm going to hop over to the actual software itself, so we can give you an example of what we're talking about. So I got a practice return loaded up, and if you're seeing our, the screen, this is in the desktop version of the software um, that we have. Uh, if you're using the online, the it might look different, but all the forms are essentially the same. If you're using the, uh, the interview-based software, you don't need to worry about this part because the main part that we're going to be worrying about is the actual application itself. Um, I am on the main information sheet. There is a section for a cell phone. If your client is doing a cell phone or text notification and you're using the interview software, feel free to you know, add a prep notes page or in the information summary page, let us know that you want the phone number to also be in the cell phone field so that way they can receive text notifications. I'm not going to go through actually completing the return so much. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to come here uh, to the actual bank application itself. And this, regardless of what platform you're using, is actually going to be uh, pretty much the exact same. It'll start off with that actual bank application. It's got the taxpayers on it. It has their refund. It looks like these people have about 4,500, a little over $4,500 available. And then there's the actual option in the middle to where you're going to choose your product. And you can see right there in the middle of the screen, prefund. This product is only available to EROs who have been approved to offer it. That's in red. And in this case, you're approved to offer it. Okay. Um, as well. Uh, you can see there's a couple little notes here about the, how they have to have a federal refund of 800 or more. I'll actually cover that a little bit later, but you want to make sure that there's enough money on the refund in order for you to justify getting the product here. Uh, this is really no different than any other bank products if you've, uh, if you've done stuff in the past. But we want our client to get that prefund, so I'm going to check that box right there, tab out of it, select somewhere else in the field, and that basically is going to prep this thing with the opportunity to go through and complete and do this prefund so the bank is notified. Now the rest of the options are pretty normal. You got your checks, your direct deposit, if you want to deposit it on the same card, the Walmart direct to cash, whichever you want. In this case, I'm going to just say refund transfer, just the check. That makes it easy. I don't have to fill too many more extra fields. And in this case, what will happen is the client will have the return sent, they'll get it accepted, they'll apply and receive their loan, it'll go on the card. And then when the IRS actually does the full-on disbursement sometime uh, later, 7, 14 days later on average, then they will have a check print authorization come to your office so you can give them the remainder of their refund. Now, when you're completing this as well, you are giving someone a green dot card, which means you're going to have the container that's got the card that you're handing the client, an envelope. It's got a number on it. That number, that green dot card number that you're going to use is going to go in the fields down there. Because it is being dispersed, this prefund product, to that card, you're going to have to hand them the card at the time of the application so that way you can take and place the number from that envelope onto the card. If you've never used card products before, I would recommend taking advantage of the uh, of our website, we have various intake documents, uh, things like that, or maybe you have a spreadsheet program, something to keep track of who you gave what card to, because once a card is used, regardless of whether or not it's accepted or whatnot, it is, it com it is completely incapable of being used again. It is essentially locked down, and you don't want to hold on to something you know, have a have a client apply for it and then accidentally forget whether or not you used it. So keep track of these things. You're going to place your numbers inside the field for the client. You're going to go ahead 
and put those down there. And then finally, there is one last checkbox underneath it that says, I have personally examined the Social Security Administration card provided to me by the applicant, which card appears to be original and genuine document. Just like normal bank products, document retention requirements, they want to make sure that you have the certain documents. In this case, they're essentially insisting that you have access to an actual Social Security card or proof of that or to that effect so that way there's there's some sort of actual you know responsibility for you to make sure that you, these are the people that you are talking to now the rest of the actual bank application has pretty normal ID social uh, everything else like you probably already familiar with there is this section right here does a taxpayer want to receive account related text messages if they do answer yes when it's available for them to choose the prefund option then they will get a text message sent to the text number that you have inside the main info sheet. I'm going to say they don't want it, they're going to go ahead and stick to email, which reminds me, by the way, that you do also want to have an email. So every version of the software, uh, regardless of what level is at, has an email field that is included in the intake process, and if not on the main info sheet, there is an email address field directly underneath the address uh, right at the top where their biographical information is. Once the client creates their account, and this is going through the rest of the process here, you, you've, you've completed the return, you fill out the application, you take whatever documents you need, shake their hands, sign paperwork, whatever. Everything's done, the return is finished, it's ready to go out the door, you hit the submission button, okay, the IRS accepts it. When the client gets that information and they go to the part of this process where they create their account, they will be presented at that time with the actual loan application and consent forms to e-sign. And like I said before, this ability only exists for 48 hours. So if the return gets accepted and they do not have the ability, like I, try to keep an eye on these acceptances, especially if you know someone is not very technically literate or maybe doesn't have regular access to the internet. You might notice something hit and get accepted maybe on a Friday and you're not going to be in the office on the weekend. Work to make sure that your clients are aware of that window because once the 48 hours is done, then there's no more chance to do this. There's no appeal process or give me a second shot. 48 hour window from the moment that return is accepted and then the opportunity is gone. So make sure that they do it. Once the client actually signs the application and the consent forms through that web portal, then the bank will immediately make a decision on both the loan availability and the amount. If the amount or if the loan is accepted, they will show the amount, whether they're qualified for a four or a $750 loan. If the loan is declined, then they will have nothing and they will have an adverse action notice sent by mail within 30 days to the address on the return. It's not gonna do anything to their credit or anything like that. It's just gonna be a simple letter that says, we couldn't do it because of these reasons. Fairly straightforward, they will be notified and it should be in their mailbox within a 30 day window. Assuming that the loan is actually approved, then they will actually have to e-sign the loan agreement. And this whole process probably takes just about as long as it takes for me to talk about it. You know, keep hitting next and running through the actual process. It's fairly quick. They, they, they apply for it, the consent, they get an approval, then they actually have to sign the agreement and say, okay, I will accept this money. Once the agreement is finally signed, then the funds are able to be dispersed to the client. And the clients are going to have their funds dispersed on that green dot debit card, which you placed on the actual application. And it's usable by the client like any other debit card. Now, this is an important note, and Joe might even hop in here and talk about it, is that this should be within a business day. So, I mean, it should be actually fairly quickly, but it's still ACH transaction and banks still are subject to their own scheduling system. So weekends, bank holidays, et cetera, will basically be skipped and then the funds will hit the next available business day after they, you know, essentially get permission to, to be dispersed to the card. Yeah, Derek, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about that. Um, Basically, what's going on is this is an ACH transaction, kind of like what Derek said, and it requires uh, the lead time for them to transfer funds. So uh, if the client goes in and is approved prior to the close of banking uh, on Monday, then the funds should hit the next day on Tuesday before the close of banking. Uh, now we do have several banking holidays coming up, one of which is MLK Day, 
uh, and banks are closed on that day. So that would not count. Uh, Saturdays and Sundays do not count. So those of you that have clients in the system that are, uh, you know, early, early filers uh, that were just approved yesterday, you know, we are looking at now Tuesday because of banking holidays and the weekends not being bank transaction days. If they are doing this on Tuesday and they're approved on Tuesday, then it should be Wednesday. But we are limited to the ACH uh, schedules and uh, bank schedules and holidays as well. Um, so I, I hope that uh, clears it up uh, just a little bit. Definitely. And that, that being said as well, make sure you keep those schedules in your mind. So if someone comes into your office to do a fresh return on Friday, unless you finish and send that return on Friday, then you're looking at potentially the acceptance not hitting them until the beginning of the next week. So obviously banking holidays, you want to try to get these people done as early and get them out as quick as possible. And that is especially true for anybody who actually has to submit information, for instance, to us in order for us to process returns and get them out the door. You want to make sure you have that taken care of as soon as possible. So scan all the documents you need, get your signature pages scanned in and uploaded, uh, you know, get this done so that way the processing can happen because obviously they're expecting money fairly quickly and the longer that it takes, the more angry they'll get with the, with the choice. Uh, at any part of the stage, by the way, the website, the myprefund.com website that we referenced earlier, they have the ability to essentially review any part of the process through the website. They can log in with the account they create and take a look and see whether it's approved, whether the funds have hit, when they signed, look at the documents that they actually consented to. All that stuff is available to them. Um, they are pretty much notified immediately throughout the entire process. And this is primarily done through email, or that's what I would recommend doing through email um, because most people have smartphones and can access websites pretty much anyway. And they can also opt to receive those text messages. And there is technically an availability for a client to log in to the My Prefund website without a text or an email notification. So if someone came in and didn't have a text number, didn't have a, uh, an email account, and they applied for this product, they could just randomly attempt to log in to the My Prefund website, but it would be completely unknown to them whether or not they had the option, whether or not the return was accepted and the availability of the product was there. They would have no idea whatsoever. It'd just be a random grab bag chance that they happen to log in within that 48, 48 hour window or they would have to keep trying over and over until they did. And that's obviously not preferable um, and it makes you look bad as well because they're expecting the return to be accepted and they, a lot of people don't really know exactly how the process goes, how long it can take from IRS submission to acceptance. So it is highly advised that you obtain an email or a text number during the return creation process. If they don't have an email, I mean you can create one for them. Uh, I mean, obviously, you can let them make the password and stuff so they feel secure about it. But I mean, you can have them create an email at the time so that way, you know, they so that way they can have access to this. And it's really easy, and it doesn't even take longer than you know, longer than a couple of minutes to do. If for some reason the return is accepted and they attempt to log into the website and it does not work, guidance from the bank specifies that if the login fails but the return is accepted, like you got the invitation and they're trying to get in stop, wait two hours, and try again. Just in case there's server misalignment or data is not transmitting as fast as they would like, the, obviously the earlier in the season it is, the busier it happens to be on the back end. So wait two hours and try again. If the return's accepted and we're going on longer than two hours, uh, then let us know and we can try and see if there is some sort of holdup. When the client gets those pre-fund emails, it should come from a sender at welcome at firstmoneycenter.com and the subject line should say start your loan application. I've got a screenshot right there of what's contained in it. Anything sensitive is blared out. Uh, I, we don't actually know exactly what the text message states yet, but it probably will say something very similar. Like your tax preparer has successfully submitted the prefund loan request. Please visit www.myprefund.com in order to complete your loan application. Something like that that gives them a link they can click. But this is the first indication that they have that the IRS has accepted the return, that the bank has the information and has preemptively created that product in order for your clients to access it. 
the website itself looks like this. This is, of course, on a desktop. I'd imagine if they have a mobile version, it will probably be more squished and more vertical. But the main thing you're wanting to look at is that button over there that says Get My Cash. They want you to click the Get My Cash button, which will actually take you into the product itself, where you will have to put your name, last name, social security number, and the date of birth and then continue forward where they will have the actual loan agreements. We don't have any screenshots of the actual loan agreement process, I'd imagine because they probably are all customized uh, to, the, to the specific individual applying. So that's definitely not something we want to throw out there. I've also got two different pieces of uh, paper over here. They're over there in the handouts, so if you're looking over there on the handouts, you can grab copies of both of these. One of them is just a client um, information document. That's over on the right-hand side, and that's just kind of describing the process and the product. And then the other one is a, is a little handout that actually describes the steps that are necessary. And as you can see, it's pretty much uh, click on that application link, um, Take, complete the application and then get your pre-fund status so you can continue the rest of it. It's fairly, fairly straightforward, fairly quick. Anybody that's done it so far hasn't had any problems. Now, obviously, after you go through the process of obtaining the loan, the client can log in and check everything out, see where the funds are, review those materials, but as well, your office has the ability to view the status of any of the submitted loan applications. And that's going to let you know when and at what stage the loan application process is for any of your clients. Anybody out there that's done a pre-fund, you'll have the ability to log into this loan information center and take a look and see where you're currently standing. And in order to do that, you're going to need your name, your P10, and your EFIN number. Uh, everybody in here should be able to access it, should have the accounts already set up. Um, and you can see this is uh, the link to, or this is the image that you're going to have to in order to log into the Loan Center. We'll be providing information more about this in the, in the future, but uh, right now when you do get to it, it'll essentially be name, P10, EFIN, and that will open up this window that says, hey, here's the Loan Information Center. You click it, and then you will have a list of all of the available clients. We've obviously blocked out the uh, blocked out the important information here, but what you're what I'm wanting to point out is that there are columns over here on the right hand side, and that'll tell you about like the application date, whether they're approved or not approved, when they sign the application, when they sign the actual agreement, and the amount that they were qualified for, and whether or not any of those funds were uh, dispersed. So. The location of this website that I'm mentioning will be sent to you guys uh, via email in a very short time period uh, when the website itself is actually finalized for usage. Obviously, the season hasn't technically started until next Tuesday, which gives them the you know the weekend and a day or so to actually work on it. Um, we don't want to provide that out there and have everybody trying to log in and the site just like redirecting a login loop or something. Um, being unable to use that website, however, is not going to impact your ability to provide the product because your, your clients individually can see the information themselves. They create that login to do the application. They can log in at any time. So ultimately what it comes down to is that you guys are basically on the same page uh, once, the, once the return's actually finished. That loan information center is going to show you for all your clients, that EFIN, last four social and date of birth, so that way you can take a take and keep track of it. And those columns describing what we're looking at, the pre-fund application date is the date of the initial invite, which is at IRS acceptance. The P, the the actual status is either approved or not approved. And if it's blank, then that means they haven't signed it yet. They haven't signed the application. Once they sign the application, um, it'll say whether it's approved or not approved, and then the rest of the columns can be filled out. If the application's signed, you'll see a date. If the agreement is actually signed that says, okay, I like this number, let's do this, then they can sign that signature date, and then the amount of the loan comes after that, which is going to be either $400 or $750 for anyone who's approved. And then finally, when the funds are dispersed, then you're going to be looking at a date listed under the pre-fund dispersal. So just scrolling back to take a look. I know it's probably kind of hard to see, especially if you're looking on a small monitor. Um, the actual date of the application that says, hey, the return's accepted, let's do this. The status of it that says whether it's approved or not. The application date and the agreement date saying, okay, here's when they applied, here's when they signed off on it, and here's how much they're going to get. And then once the funds start hitting the card, then we'll start seeing dates in the far right column.
Now, your servicing options post-loan are really not much more robust than theirs. So once you've submitted the return and given them the card, there's really not much more that you can do besides tell them the status of the loan application, which they can check themselves by logging in. Uh, there is no appeal process for this or a second chance on the loan. The decisions are instantaneous and they are based upon the tax return data. There's no you know, opportunity for you to go, okay, well, here's the reason why this is on the return. There, there's no bargaining. It is instantaneously done based upon their tax return data and uh, whatever risk calculations they use in the back end, and they will know immediately whether or not they're getting it or not. A denial does nothing else to the return or the funding. Everything else proceeds as normal. If they get denied, it's like it never happened. The card, if they're going to use the card for their refund, then it'll get the full balance of whatever they're supposed to get, just like normal, when the IRS funds it. If it's a check, you'll print it, and so on. It'll do nothing. It's just like, just like it never happened. And then finally, got some notes for the ERO. The ERO... Um, when we're talking about this, if I say ERO, electronic return originator, just replace that with you. That is the person who creates and electronically sends the return. And while the prefund loan product is free to the taxpayer, as in it does not increase their bank fees, it does not take money out of their refund, it is not free to the ERO or preparer. And what the prefund does is it costs the office $35 for every funded loan product and the client's tax refunds themselves are not affected. Now, considering the, uh, the arrangement that we have with our offices, Federal Direct splits this extra cost, which means that any pre-fund return that is applied for and funded is going to net the office a refund of $1,750. We'll cover half, the remainder half goes to you guys. The details that we have on that are still developing over when that will be made available, whether it's reconciled immediately or later, I'm sure Joe will probably hop in and describe it, but uh, th that's, pretty much, that's pretty much the cost for it. Is the client's not going to pay for it, but it comes out uh, essentially uh, uh, from the offices, and then we split the cost with you guys. Hey, Derek, I'll jump in real quick and talk about sure. this uh, while you're on that slide. And uh, so basically, uh, our understanding of the way that uh, this is going to be reconciled with the bank is if you guys, uh, let's say the preparation fee on a client's uh, return that is approved for prefund uh, is $100. If that is the case, the return funds as normal, the prep fees that would be deposited would actually be $65. So if that is the process that they are going to be moving forward with, we would then be reimbursing 1750. Uh, so uh, the typical hierarchy um, when it comes to your clients' refunds and you know eventually them getting their net check is IRS and financial management services uh, have the first or most uh, senior uh, higher or element in the hierarchy. So if they owe back taxes, back child support, back uh, federal debt, that would be handled first. Second in that hierarchy are the bank fees and the repayment of the prefund. So that comes out of their refund next. Then is you in there, the uh, preparation fees. And last in the chain of hierarchy there would be your client getting their net refund check. Uh, so all of those factor in uh, and pretty much uh, preparation fees are, are very, you know, I guess higher than the client in that regard, but certainly uh, bank fees and IRS or federal back debt could jump in and grab uh, potential prep fees or client refunds uh, as well. But uh, uh, again, this will be, um, kind of a learning experience here uh, going through the first week or two of uh, revenue reporting. And uh, as we get more detail, more data uh, that we're privy to, uh, we will certainly uh, update you guys as well. So uh, appreciate a little bit of patience as we're going through that. But uh, worst case scenario, uh, if there is a lag as far as indicating which clients had the $35 or were approved for the prefund, uh, we will do a reconciliation 
uh, post revenue reporting if that's necessary. But our hope and our goal is that that is a real time capability where that will be uh, included with the weekly revenue reports uh, that we traditionally do. All right. Getting close to this, uh, some final thoughts before we move into uh, questions, which I can definitely see people are taking advantage of over on the side. And this is to just remember that pre-fund returns cannot contain certain forms, and they have to have at least a Form W-2 or a 1099-R. So no Schedule C only returns, no EIC denial returns, no injured spouse returns, because the funding is entirely decided on risk level to the bank. And if the bank sees a tax return come in, and they see that this person's gotten in trouble for tax fraud before or that there is no verifiable way with like record documents the IRS has to justify like income on it then they're just going to walk away from it so it's got to got to have that w2 can't use any of those you know forms that doesn't mean you can't have a schedule c on the return it doesn't mean that at all it just means that you can't have only a schedule c or only non uh, non wage statement income non pension annuity income it's got to be legitimate W-2, 1099-R, somewhere on the return. The client also has to have a refund large enough to receive the product. The software is not going to let you do it unless there is a minimum of $800 refund. Uh, as a real off-the-cuff answer, I would probably say 1500 is a good number because that gives you the ability to have the refund and also have the bank fees added on there and not have any sort of uh, issue with the ratio of refund to, to fees or anything like that. But as long as it's at least 800 then it's going to go through. If they have a really small refund, $400, $500, it might be more uh, prudent to switch that over to an e-file. Uh, or use a, a different method because obviously they won't be able to do the pre-fund on it. So make sure to keep that in mind. Uh, Joe actually touched that uh, a little bit early, uh, but once again, right here, just to give you a visual representation, hierarchy of who gets paid in order, always the IRS or FMS. FMS is the Financial Management Service. That's the Department of the Treasury that's responsible for handling legal and state-based debt back taxes, child support, judgments, garnishments, liens where they have the ability to take funds, that's going to go first. Next is going to be the bank, they're going to collect their fees, first money setter, TPG, whatever, and then the prep fees, they're sent to us and then reconciled to you guys during the normal refund cycle. Anybody that's here has history, knows exactly what we're talking about here, and then finally the client who's going to get that remainder um, as well. Details on the card itself, I know some people are not really uh, too happy with prepaid debit cards of some kind. Transfers, ATM usage, withdrawal, limits, fees, ATM locations, etc. All of that should be contained with informational material that's present with the cards. So you might want to dig your card stock up, take a look at the paperwork, and try to familiarize yourself with some of these types of questions before they ask you about it. Because there's nothing like having somebody come in to do a pre-fund, you go to give them a card, they express their reservations, and then you can't answer a single question and they back out of it and maybe even back out of your office like get, get yourself familiar with the product before they ask questions about it is it's a, a lot more confidence building if you're just able to rattle off whatever answers they need or provide them the materials uh, as well the, I know this process is new I'm fairly certain we made a, a pretty good uh, a pretty good run at describing exactly how it operates if at any time during the tax season you got a question you're more than welcome to call us 866-357-2052, uh, email at support at Federal Direct Tax, or if you have other email contacts you prefer, feel free. Uh, we are open from 9 to 9, Eastern Standard, Monday to Friday. Saturday hours are from 10 to 6, once again, Eastern Standard. Any changes in future hours, of course, you guys will be notified by email, newsletter, weekly conference calls, whatever. So at this point, uh, questions, if you have them over there on the side, feel free to shoot them over and uh, we'll do our best to get them answered while we got you guys on the line. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, Derek. Uh, I've been kind of logging a lot of the questions that have came in while Derek's been uh, uh, talking and delivering the content here. So I'll go ahead and start uh, kind of rattling through some of those for everybody's benefit. Uh, if you have any questions that you haven't gotten to ask yet, please feel free to type those in over on the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen uh, under the questions area, and uh, we'll try to address those as well. But uh, some of the uh, higher 
uh, I guess, more relevant questions that have came through here that have been uh, um, relevant for the entire group, one of which is uh, what card number is entered in on the SB application, and I'm very glad that someone asked that. Uh, that is the card number that shows through the window on the envelope that the cards uh, are physically in. Uh, as the tax preparer, you do not open the envelope that your client's card comes in. Uh, you will be able to see the number uh, through that window that goes on the SB application. Uh, so that is not the card number off of the physical card, that is the number that shows through that window. Uh, I had a question as far as card servicing, and uh, actually had somebody call in today that uh, had some questions along these lines uh, with one of their clients. And when it comes to setting up the PIN numbers for the card, when it comes to uh, direct deposit questions, when it comes to requesting additional cards for family members, this is a prepaid debit card just like they would walk into a retail store and buy one or sign up for one. You as the tax preparer have zero ability to interact and liaise with the card provider on your tax paying client's behalf. Uh, this is their card, this is their, in essence, bank account that is being structured. Once the card is activated, uh, your client can call Green Dot and then go through any normal process uh, as far as servicing that card, but that is outside of your arena and abilities. So uh, another issue that we've had if someone tries to call the number on the back of the card before their tax return is accepted or before they've gone on there and been able to be acknowledged through the First Money Center website, Green Dot will have no clue of who your client is. Uh, part of that registration process is the information off of their tax return, be it name, social number, date of birth, all going to the bank and the card company to, in essence, activate and register that card. So 30 seconds after you hit send on your tax return, if they open up that envelope and immediately call the number on the card, they are going to have no clue of who your client is. They need to wait until their return is accepted for that information to be uh, populated through the system. So those of you that are filing returns now, uh, before the IRS is technically open for business, returns are not processing nearly as quickly as when the IRS is fully operational. So you might file a client's return now, and it might not get accepted by the IRS for several hours or several days, depending on how the hub testing is going and how many returns the IRS decides they feel like pulling in and when they decide to do that. So bear that in mind. You have to have an accepted return for any of this uh, to start processing uh, through the system. So uh, uh, bear that in mind. A lot of questions coming through as far as what about clients with I-10 numbers as opposed to social security numbers? Uh, you know, this is again a traditional prepaid card. Uh, and part of the Patriot Act out there is knowing your client, you have to have some type of verifiable information on that client. Uh, there are plenty of I-10 holders that have no problem registering prepaid cards. We've worked with numerous prepaid card companies in prior years, but it all boils down to is, is there any type of historical data out there for this individual? If they just now registered for an I-10 number a couple months ago, maybe a year ago, have never gone out and got a bank account, don't have a mortgage, don't have anything else in their name in that I-10 number, chances are that they will be unable to be verified through that system. So worst case scenario, they aren't able to be verified. That means that they won't get approved for the 750 or the $400 advance, and their refund will simply be flipped over to a paper check that would be printed out at your office. So I, uh, I hope that kind of clears it up. Uh, but again, you know, you got to have some type of verifiable information out there. We are creating a bank account for this client, and if there is nothing out there, it doesn't meet those federal guidelines as far as uh, what the requirements for the Patriot Act are. 
Okay, um, I have seen uh, a whole bunch of questions kind of coming in here now. Uh, Derek, do you want to roll through some of those and uh, I'll kind of get at uh, the ones that haven't been addressed yet and maybe follow sure up thing. with those? Sure thing. Just looking through some of the questions that we have, trying to find ones that are kind of relevant to everybody is, uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, yeah. Obviously, when is the when is the taxpayer given the green dot card? Joe covered that at the time that they do the return. You don't open it. You don't do anything like that. You give them the card and the, the relationships between them. Um, and the bigger thing, the, the second part that I want to address is if the client doesn't get approved for the loan, then that card is dead in the water and does nothing. They can throw it away. Shred it up, throw it away. I mean, they could keep the card active if they want to use it for other purposes like any other retail card, but you don't have them give the card back to you. You don't use it again. It's like claiming a dependent on a return. Once that social hits, kid can't be e-filed. Once the card number is used on an application, that card is tied to that individual, cannot be used for any other purpose. So hand them the card at the time of filing unopened and use the number in the window on your application. And I, I cautioned earlier, keep a log on the side so you know what card number went with what person. It just makes it a lot easier for you to keep track of which cards are good and which cards are bad. But they should walk out the door with that card when they file the return. Um, okay, do we need a, a like a signature pen or a pad to e-sign? When I say e-sign, when I'm talking about the e-sign in this, I'm not talking about an actual signature pad where they take a pen on a tablet and draw a name out. What we're talking about is an like electronic application like you applying for something online or paying for something from a retail site like Amazon or eBay. The application is present. You can only access the application if the return is accepted and you have the personal information so that's secure enough for you to go into it and then the actual application, the e-signing portion is basically reading, typing, and then clicking the OK or Agree button. That's how that process goes. It doesn't mean you need to physically sign anything. You don't doodle your name. You just fill out the boxes and hit buttons to go through. And once they've done the application and they've done the consent forms and submitted those, the bank makes their decision. And if it's good to go, they do it one more time on the actual agreement. And that gives the bank permission to drop the, uh, drop the funds onto the card along their normal funding cycles. Uh, let's see here. Is there information available in Spanish? I do not have uh, information on that. I, I believe the answer to that is no. Um, if anything on that happens to change, we will definitely let any Spanish-speaking offices or Spanish uh, locations know as soon as possible. And then finally as well, fees associated with the card. It is a prepaid card, so of course there are going to be some fees to it. The fees are relatively low, but they have the ability to transfer money from the card to another account or to access, uh, I believe there's over 26,000 money pass qualified ATM machines across the country that they can withdraw the, uh, the money from the card on it. So uh, several people will get the prepaid card and then they will immediately go empty the entire thing. Um, and then basically cancel the account afterwards. So that is definitely a possibility. Um, just like any other prepaid card, you have the opportunity to, your client has the opportunity to do that. And all of the fee structures should be relatively well accessible in materials or given a link to it so you can find that information out. Great. Hey, thanks, Derek. That looks like most of the questions there that uh, that I see on the panel. Um, you know, one one thing to remember and reference, and you know, of course, we're dealing with early season filers that you know need this money. Uh, you know, expect this money, and really already probably have it spent on a number of different necessities. But the worst thing that can happen is they get denied for the advance, and there are zero fees. You know, this is a free advance, absolutely free to your client. So if they say, oh, you know, if they get, you know, I, I didn't get approved. Why didn't I get approved? What's the, you know, what's the reasoning? What's the issue? And, you know, I am sorry that um, everybody, we can't just give 750 bucks to everybody. Uh, but, you know, it's not your job to apologize for First Money Center's policies. Uh, we are seeing a pretty decent approval rate. Uh, up to this point, uh, and really, you know, we're still not even at the start of the tax season. Their stated goal is somewhere between 75 to 80 percent approval ratio. So they have defined their requirements already, as Derek mentioned. You know, you got to have a W-2 or 1099-R on the return. 
uh, and they've they've tried to eliminate a lot of the high fraud potentials in there. But uh, you know they're looking for a very high funding ratio. In prior years, the different type of advanced programs that uh, you know we've kind of used and piecemealed together have had something a little closer to maybe a 40% approval ratio. So we're actually looking for a very high approval ratio. You know this is supposed to be something to help uh, earn new clients into your business uh, and get some money out early. Ever since the IRS removed the debt indicator back in 2009. Uh, the industry has really been in a state of flux when it comes to getting money on the street early. And if you're not willing to put your own money out there, this is a fantastic opportunity and a fantastic way to do it. So, um, Derek, you got anything, uh, any new questions in there that you want to address before we uh, wrap it up? Sure. I uh, just want to reiterate that you have the option, like I said, there are transfers, there's withdrawals for the cards, but if you have specific questions about the card itself, if there's any transfer fees or any costs or anything like that, then you'll need to reference the materials with the card or contact Green Dot because we do not, like we don't have a, a card press in the back that's making these things out. <laughs> so if they, uh, if, if they have questions about the card itself, either reference the materials that are available or contact Green Dot directly. And uh, one more option, uh, yeah, to reiterate, do you know? Do we need to send any uh, documents to to us? You don't have to send us any documents to get the pre-fund product. Uh, essentially, unless you are under an obligation to provide us documents to have your return sent in the first place, uh, there's there's no additional requirement. You know, if you're sitting out there and you're you're filing returns like on your own, you're hitting the actual submit button. There's no need to send us anything. That's entirely between the IRS, the bank, the client, and you completing the return. There's no other submission requirements. Hey, Derek, there's one last uh, question there. I saw somebody plug in that's pretty relevant. Uh, if your client is not approved for the advance, do you, the ERO or tax office owner, still have to pay the $35 fee? No. If they are not approved, there are no fees associated with that client or with that product. So again, uh, Fantastic opportunity here with very, very minimal cost and zero risk. Uh, so going to be a few uh, hitches uh, in the process. Certainly, like I said, uh, this is the first year uh, for Green Dot in the industry. This is the first year for this pre-fund advance to be uh, offered nationwide with the exception of a handful of different states. Uh, so it's a learning year. Uh, I, I appreciate any type of patience that you guys can give us, uh, and we are certainly working very hard and diligently to get uh, any information uh, on the process and procedures um, out to you guys uh, as quickly as we can. So, uh, Derek, thanks for your delivery. I appreciate the information. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and uh, wrap it up and sign off, and uh, we'll close her out. No problem, no problem. For anybody that's listening, like I said, feel free to give us a call if you got any questions. One thing I did want to say before we finally closed it down is that uh, with no prior history, you should have 10 cards. If you need more or you expect to need more, contact us so that way we can get you taken care of. Obviously, we don't want you to be ha be out of cards with clients sitting in your office wanting this product. So if uh, you're doing returns, you're running out, if you need more, uh, give us a call as soon as you identify that that is a necessity, and we will do our best to get them shipped out to you as soon as humanly possible. Great. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks, Derek, and we will talk to everybody soon. Bye-bye.